get my six. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the most awesomest homesteading channel on the planet that has nothing whatsoever to do with homesteading. Homesteading off the grid. <clears throat> now, I'm looking back that way because just before I hit record, I clearly heard footsteps. It's evening. We just had some rain. We are where field meets forest and we're at elevation. So the veil is growing thin. And as hot as it's been, uh, which has not been as hot as it has been, uh, still fall is in the air. Um, there are some leaves that are starting to fall. I mean, look behind me. You see those yellow leaves from the, from the yellow tulip poplars? Um, the squirrels are out cutting on the nuts and, uh, you know, the, the deer, I've not found any buck rubs yet, but I know they're coming. Um, and football has started. Uh, that's why I've been away for a few days. You know, my son's playing football this fall, tackle for the first time. He's done flag for like six or seven years. Uh, he's ready for tackle. He's finally doing tackle. And FYI, I am officially coaching at an official capacity. It's no longer just a parent volunteer walk on bringing the snacks. It's background check complete. Um, certification halfway through it. it will be complete by tomorrow. Um, it's five days a week, Monday through Friday for practice. That's what we've been doing. Uh, it's great. I love it. I love every minute of it. Uh, it's just, I've been busy, but fall is in the air. So, which brings us to today's topic. I got something from Amazon today, just like most days. What is it? Oh, look at that. It's a book. Just like most days. Oh, I'm an avid reader. Sometimes 10 books a month. It's crazy. Love to read, love to write. You know that. So this is True Hauntings Volume 5. By this guy. Get my six. Yeah. And, no, by you guys mostly. I did some editing, a couple of stories I wrote in here. Um... But I will read you a story from it today. It is available now, as you can see, from Amazon on, in, on Kindle and in print. Link is in the description box below. Uh, it, it's ironic because there's something I kind of wanted to talk about here this evening. As you know, we don't really do homesteading. We go out in the woods and look for creepy stuff or talk about life experiences, life advice, current issues, how crazy the world is. Um, the world's a crazy place. I'll tell you, here's something I was it, it just, listen, I work in social media. We're here, uh, got 864,000 followers on Facebook, on Sick Twisted Humor, now like almost 16,000 on Instagram at Sick Twisted Humor, and of course, homesteading off the grid. Um, and as somebody that works in social media, there are certain things I'm not allowed to talk about. Crazy, isn't it? Um, I can understand it to some degree, but some of it, it is, it's just really, it's, um, censorship. It really is. Uh, but there's this issue with the Olympics with women's boxing. <clears throat> uh, I heard about it when it happened, supposedly the, the Algerian female boxer, uh, was not a female, et cetera, et cetera. This is what you're hearing. You've seen people losing their minds over this stuff. I always like to look for facts. This is crazy. I'm becoming like such a dinosaur in the days in which we live because most people just jump on a bandwagon, whichever bandwagon um, goes along with their school of thought. I don't. I try to find the truth and then form an opinion if there's enough information. And if not, I just, I will choose not to have an opinion. That's one of the ways in which I'm weird. Listen, and I'm going to say this, the faker you are, the bigger your social circle will be, the more real you are, the smaller it's going to be. And that's why I have like two friends. I have more than two. But so I looked into that because I am a, I'm a huge boxing fan, um, big sports fan, coach, a coach. I've been coaching for almost 30 years now off and on since i got this kid down here now he's 13 and big as me it's been on for the last eight years um he got his his helmet and pads yesterday we distributed that we me and the other two coaches 
distributed that from the equipment room before practice yesterday. And my son is so excited about this. The whole way home, we got a 30 minute truck ride uh, to practice and back because we live like on the opposite end of the county of where, I know it's crazy. There's five high schools in our county, I think. Um, four, okay, four. It's a big county in central Virginia. And so we're in, you know, this one district uh, where he will go to high school if certain things are met here over the next year. And it has nothing to do with him. It has to do with the public school system that we pulled him out of. He's homeschooling now. Uh, but really, in our, even in our district, we're still 30 minutes away. So, but my point of that is he was so excited to finally have his helmet and, and shoulder pads and stuff. He wore his helmet home in the truck last night. And then this morning, I come downstairs, I was upstairs working, I come downstairs, he's doing his chores, one of which is the vacuum, and uh, I hear the vacuum going, and he's doing it in his shoulder pads, because he's just so excited, and it was so cute. I took a picture of it and put it on our Sick Twisted Humor Facebook page, if you want to see our son Daniel vacuuming our house in shoulder pads. Excuse me, it's so cute, he's so excited, so am I. Um, so, uh... Here's my point about what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it's not football. It's not about being busy. I am going to read a story from here, but it's about, and this story goes along with this. It's about, because I, I'm, I'm interacting with people again, <clears throat> um, which is something I go out of my way to avoid. But when you do coach, you're always with kids, parents, siblings, grandparents. <clears throat> it's so enjoyable. I love it. And a lot of these kids on the team, even though this is Daniel's first year and my first year with tackle, a lot of these kids played flag football with him, some on the same team, some on opposing teams. So it's really neat to see some of the kids that we were always up against on game day were now together as a, as a team. And that helps me kind of know, oh, I remember that guy. He was the quarterback for that other flag team. He's good. This guy was a receiver. He's good. It's wonderful. Um, but I'm dealing with people, and there's a lot to do with that. So, uh, I was recently speaking with one of my friends who was going on and on about, uh, their toxic, couple of toxic relationships, one with a spouse from whom they're not estranged, they're separated, um, but they are in contact with each other. It's really unfortunate in my humble opinion. And one of their children, uh, very toxic relationship. And I was listening and I'm trying to empathize and I kind of do because it's terrible. Some of the stuff that's going on. But then I was reminded of this fact. This is something Sergeant First Class Eddie Baker taught me in the Army back when I was stationed at uh, Fort Lewis, which is now joint base Lewis McCord or something like that. They combined the Air Force Base McCord with the Army Base Fort Lewis together. And this was when I got back from Iraq. And I was actually stationed there for six months. I was in the Warriors in Transition Battalion. I got hurt in Iraq, had to have surgery, go through all this rehab. I was there for six months. And uh, boy, that was a long six months, let me tell you. Whew, man, those were dark days. But I had a platoon sergeant. Sergeant First Class Baker, Eddie Baker, big man. He was a he was a black man. Uh, he was six foot two, two twenty, and he wasn't fat. He was solid. He had the perfect build for like a heavyweight boxer. He was pro he was probably six three, two twenty. He was he same size as Muhammad Ali, um, same size as the current heavyweight champion Alexander Usyk from Ukraine, who freaking upset the Gypsy King who I'm a fan of, and I'm rooting for the Gypsy King during their rematch later in the year. Uh, but, hey, Usyk. So, anyway, the first day in this unit, this guy, Sergeant First Class Baker, says, uh, I will treat you the way you let me know how you want to be treated. And you will let me know how you want to be treated based upon how you treat me. And I thought, what's that mean? Because, you know... I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Uh, well, I saw through my eyes exactly what he meant over that six-month period. 
I treated Sergeant First Class Baker with respect and dignity. He was my superior. He was my platoon sergeant. He was a human being. I got to know him considerably well, and he was a heck of a guy. I really like this guy. He's the kind of guy that, out of the Army, I could very easily be friends with. Um, he treated me like royalty. I, I don't know if I ever had, I've never, I can say this. I never had an E7 in the army treat me as respectfully and as dignified as Sergeant First Class Baker treated me. And he would tell you that that's because that's how I treated him. We had a couple of a-holes in our unit and he treated them like, well, if you saw this guy dealing with these guys, you would think, man, Sergeant Baker's a D word. He's a P word. He's a effing worded B word. He's an S O B word. Just, but guess what? That's cause that's how those guys treated him. But he could go from being all those letters to just, then he'd come to a guy like me and I would be a little bit nervous, but I was an E4. I was a specialist, but like a light switch, he just, he was a different person, and it's because that's he treated me the way I treated him. And I spoke with him at length about that just before I got out. I told him I was there for six months, and once I got my release papers and I was getting ready to get released and go to the Philippines for six years, didn't see that coming, but it happened. Um, and I'm glad it did because my life is what it is today because of that. Um, I brought that up. I was like, man, you'd be with so-and-so, and... -so and uh, man, you were mean, and I had to talk to you next, and I was nervous. He'd laugh, he, and he said, would you remember what I told you on the first day? And I was like, I do remember it, and you were like true to your word. And he said, you know what? Life really can be that simple. And he told me, he said, those guys that I had to be an a-hole to, he said, in the private sector, civilian sector, out there in the real world, if they were not part of my unit, if I didn't have to be associated with them, I wouldn't. He says, because I got too much respect for myself, I've got too much respect for my peace to associate with people that are going to treat me disrespectfully. So outside, when, he said, once I take this army uniform off, I don't deal with people like that. I'm sure he's retired now. We were about the same age at the time, mid-30s. That was 15, uh, 10 years, shoot, 15 years ago, 2009. Wow, where has the time gone? been 13 years i'm sure he's retired he probably had 15 years in by then um so why am i telling you about this because i was thinking about about my friend this person that was going on and on today about their toxic relationships with their spouse that they really should not be married to um and uh, one of their children that's almost an adult um at some point that person gave those people permission to treat them that way because she tolerated the treatment. Guys, that's a hard pill. That is a hard pill to swallow. And this is someone that I like. It's someone I respect. This person is an educated professional. They are an excellent parent. I can't think of anything bad to say about this person. What I can say is that unfortunately, this person has let other people know it's okay to walk all over top of them because they have allowed that behavior. So speaking for myself in my own life, uh, I was very similar for the majority of my life. I'm 50 now, okay, 50. I know I look 35, but I'm actually 50. And I know some a-hole is gonna say, bro, I thought you were 60. Yeah. Hey, enjoy the safety of being behind that computer screen, brah. I want to quote Mike Tyson. The problem with people today is uh, because of technology and social media, they've too easily had the opportunities to be a-holes without having to get punched in the face for it. All right, so anyway... Um, you know, and this is why I really like coaching because I get to work with these young people and I get to encourage and I get to motivate them. I'm, I'm taking these courses on actually becoming certified. Like I can go coach at any high school or below level in the country after this. And uh, everybody needs somebody to believe in them. And because children especially believe what they hear, especially from the people that are 
they're, they're, they're care providers, they're parents, grandparents, whatever. So I was told I was a worthless piece of crap my whole life. Um, and I was always an overachiever, and I think that really, look at, I know it's because I wanted to prove I wasn't a worthless piece of crap. I excelled in most things I did because I worked extremely hard. I was state champion in track. I was all state and cross country. I was good in music and band. I was the drum major. As you know, excellent writer, uh, international award-winning journalist. Uh, and I think it's because I was always trying to say to the parental figures from my family of origin, my earth family, who is not my... I've divorced them and F them. Um, <clears throat> this is a cool thing about once you grow up and you kind of figure out how the world works, you get to pick your family. You don't pick your family that you're born into, but once you grow up and you can kind of get out on your own, you get to choose who gets to be in your life and who doesn't. And the people who were constantly trying to convince me I was a worthless piece of crap, guess what? They're not allowed in my life. But I let them stay in my life until I was about 40, at which point I said, no, no more, no more. And man, did that make all the difference in the world. Today, I am happily married to my best friend who I would rather spend every waking minute of every day with than anybody else. <clears throat> I am blessed with a healthy, happy son that I love more than I love my own life. He's down there waiting for me to finish up this video because he's putting his pads on and his helmet and we're gonna go out in the field and play football this evening. It's gonna be his first time to actually catch and throw with it because we didn't put them on yesterday for practice. We had to do 10 hours of conditioning in that first week before we can go to pads. So next week we'll be in pads and helmets and actually hitting and tackling. Um, life is beautiful. We, we, we have six acres out here right outside of Charlottesville, Virginia. This is prime real estate. Uh, an incredible career with the social media, 1.3 million followers, Dozens of books written and published. Uh, more food than we can eat in the house. Money's just piling up in the basement and coming out through the windows and the bank and the stocks are paying dividends. Every month it's like, oh wow, how do we get that many shares of that stock? I thought, we oh, they paid another dividend and it reinvested. Life is good. We have no problems. That's all a direct result from finally at 40 years old, disassociating myself from abusive people, toxic people, narcissists, sociopaths, anybody who would ish, wish me ill. Because see, people, they want to see you do good, just not as good as them. Now, of course, I'm not, that's not my family of origin. They were always abusive, always toxic, always you're a worthless piece of crap. Um, but other people I've met since then, off and on, oh, you're okay, yeah, you're okay, until they think you're doing a little bit better than them. And then, then so you know what? Bye-bye to them as well. And, and I'm getting to the story. Gosh, I can't believe I've been talking for 18 minutes. I haven't even read the story yet. But I was thinking of all these things while I was listening to this woman talk, when she was going blah, 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 about this and that. And, and again, my heart goes out to her. I, I like her very much, and I, I can empathize for her. I would not want to be in her situation. But the thing is, I have been... And the only way to solve that and to get out of that situation is to set boundaries, let it be known, I will not be treated like this. Nobody who treats me like this is gonna be allowed in my circle. Before I made that decision, I struggled with poverty, homelessness, underemployment. I would self-sabotage at times. Hey, I was a stockbroker when I first came to Charlottesville, Virginia, and I remember I became, I worked for a firm, I won't say their name because they're not deserving of free advertisement on my platforms because I actually am more known than they are. Uh, they, they told me when I quit to go to the army after we were attacked on September 11th that that was the dumbest decision I'd ever made because I'd never make the amount of money I was making there again, blah, 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 whatever. I make multiple times more now than I ever made there. Um, I am actually in touch with some of the guys I used to work with who are still there smoking them when it comes to like comparing the tax returns they're smoking them okay so they were wrong and for that they will get no free advertisement but um i would achieve success there and then i would for example okay i became the the first profitable branch office for that brokerage firm in the charlottesville virginia community 
in that firm's history, and they've been trying to establish an office here for 50 years, half a century. It's a tough market economically. Um, there's a lot of money here, but just a very few people have it, and it's mostly UVA, the University of Virginia, the greed king of all greed kings. I mean, they're going around buying up as much of Charlottesville as they can so they can charge for parking on the street, and they will tow your car in five minutes if you didn't pay the meter. Big old money-making thing. They get all these donations from these people that die and so they'll tell that they will tear down a perfectly good building to build a new one to name after whatever dead dude just gave him 20 million you know what i mean greed greed so many people think universities are places of higher education no they're not they're places of indoctrination and profit centers it's what they are let's go cavaliers yeah i, I like their sports <laughs> i like the sports So wish we were better at football. So, um, okay, so I did that. I achieved that. I was so proud. Couldn't wait to go tell the parental figures. And, of course, I was told, oh, you're getting so high up there on that horse of yours. You need to be taking down a couple notches. Who do you think you are? You ain't nothing but a dumb hillbilly from West Virginia like the rest of us. That kind of stuff. So I would self-sabotage. I would intentionally fail. I would make sure not to be successful because hey these are the these are the people that brought me up what they say matters right and i caught myself doing that in my 20s in my 30s in, and then when i was 40 years old after i'd fought in a war after i'd gotten hurt it's been six months in an army hospital got addicted to eight different medications been through hell lost my family lost my my, my three children from my first marriage i was like you know what f everybody who doesn't support me if you don't support me then f you you're not with me and now I'm a millionaire, honest to God, in 10 years. I literally was homeless. I was taking baths in parking lots with gallon jugs of water in the winter, jumping out of the truck. I'd be in this little crappy truck I had. The heat was on. I'd get naked in the truck, jump out into the parking lot, douse myself with water, soap off, rinse off, and then jump back in the truck to get warm. Honest to God, true story. Sleeping behind churches, behind dumpsters. I'd park back there. I'd get in the back and I'd bury my, myself in my sleeping bag with like boxes of my stuff so nobody could see me. I remember it was terrifying. Terrifying. One night, this was out in Washington State just before I went to Iraq. I couldn't wait to go to Iraq because I knew once I deployed with my National Guard unit, I was going to have housing, food. But I was homeless. I was in my truck, in my sleeping bag. It was the latest snowfall of the year in recorded history out there. I think it was April. It was freezing. I was back there, damn near freezing to death. And here come the police with their spotlight. And I'm like, oh gosh, I hope they don't, they don't see me in here. But I had so much stuff over top of me, they couldn't see me. And they left. And that's because basically I tolerated people telling me that that's who I was. That's where I belonged. <laughs> the hell I did and the hell I do. This is all mine, everything you see. And we all deserve to have the best of everything we're willing to work for. You know, you know why, Coach? And this is part of it because these things I'm taking, these courses, that, that question keeps coming up. Why do you coach? What's your purpose? What are your goals? And let me tell you, I just learned this. I've never heard this wording. Your purpose is permanent and your goals are tiny little steps you take to kind of feed that purpose. And part of my purpose is to let every single young person who is under my tutelage understand they are important. They are worthy. They are good. They deserve the best. They deserve happiness. Uh, because, and I'm thinking back on it because they keep saying, remember a coach who did this, remember a coach who did that, uh, who influenced you. When I think back on my youth, if it hadn't been for some of the coaches I had, I would have never excelled at anything. I never would have achieved success in anything. I would have never believed I was worth anything more than the worthless piece of crap my family of origin always told me that I was. 
Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on in this head up here with these coaching courses and, and talking to that, that person today. And it's unfortunate, uh, here, it, but here, here's the hard pill to swallow when we're in that position. When you're the guy or the girl taking baths in secluded parking lots with gallons of water because you're homeless, uh, or when you're the, the person that's being abused by a partner and whose children, or at least one child, is being abused by your partner and their other parental figure, there's only one person who can step in and say, this is it, that's enough, and that's, that's us. That's us. Listen, the first time something happens, we are a victim. But if we continue to go back to our abusers and allow that same undesirable behavior to happen, we're accomplices. And people will treat us the way we let them know we want to be treated. And we do that in two ways. Number one, it's how we treat them. And number two, it's what, how, it's what we tolerate. If you're being abusive to me and I keep letting you come around or I keep going around you, I'm basically giving you permission to continue to be abusive to me. But once I've had enough, I'll stop going around you and I'll make sure you don't come around me. I don't want you here and I'll let that be clear. That's the only way to make it stop. That's it. And if your abuser is pursuant, call the damn police. Yeah, it works. All right. Let me see if I can read this. Because let me tell you, this is terrifying. This is probably the scariest story in this book. I received an email by a, I think a stalker. Um, and I put it in this book as one of the stories. It's only going to take a couple minutes. Let me get to it now that I've been talking for 30 minutes. Okay. It's called I Am Antipathy. Submitted anonymously. And their email address was a bunch of letters and numbers. So it says, Kevin, I give you my permission to tell my tale. And I want you to do so on your YouTube channel, Homesteading Off the Grid. And I'd like you to include it in one of your upcoming True Hauntings collections because I want it to reach as many people as it can because I believe it can help many. Well, here we are, Margaret. I am not a bad person. I would venture to say I'm a good person and I'm really, really nice. People will never remember me for having accomplished anything because for the most part I haven't and never will, but I know people will remember me for being nice and for draining them. You see, I am quite the opposite of what you'd call an empath. I know you know what an empath is because I've heard you talk about it on your YouTube channel. As you know, empaths have the ability to sense other people's moods even if no words are spoken. And dangerously, empaths have the ability to absorb other people's moods. I say dangerously because if those moods are bad, things don't end well for the empath. The empath will absorb that negative energy and might need days, if not weeks, of alone time to diffuse. They're spot on. They totally get empaths. I'm an empath. I totally understand this. This is where I come in. You see, I am an antipath. I am an antipath. And I am an empath's worst nightmare. Basically, my whole life, I have developed disdain for people that I meet and actually like. I can meet someone, really hit it off with them, find out about all kinds of things we have in common, and then later, when thinking back on the contact with the person, come to despise them. Why is this? Basically, I think it's because I hate myself. I've always felt naturally inferior to pretty much everyone around me. I was not abused as a child. I had supportive parents. They paid for my college, and when I've needed financial help throughout the years, they've never hesitated to help me. My point to all of this is that I can't blame my parents. I had what I consider to be a normal childhood. I wasn't bullied. I was okay at anything I did, though I never excelled at anything in particular. Largely, I'm sure, because I never tried. I've never really pushed myself to succeed at anything, and as a result, I haven't. But back to what I want to warn people about. You see, as an antipath, someone who will naturally develop a disdain towards others for no reason, I will often seek out empaths like yourself for the sole purpose of draining them. 
I am very negative and pessimistic. I'm the kind of guy that if I won the lottery, I would gripe and complain because of all the taxes I would have to pay on the winnings. I always look for the downside in everything. We all know people like this, right? Listen up if this is reminding you of somebody. I had a cousin years ago who, like you, Kevin, was an empath. Our parents used to make us hang out together because he didn't really have a lot of friends. I would come to understand years later that that was because he was an empath and he didn't like having his emotions constantly roller coastering due to being around a lot of different people who were experiencing a lot of different moods. Anyway, when I would hang out with my cousin, I would drain him so badly with my negativity and pessimism that he would often end up in tears. Eventually, his mother, my mom's sister, wouldn't let me within a hundred feet of my cousin. She was convinced I was doing something to hurt him, which I was, of course, though it was nothing physical. When I came to fully understand my powers, as I like to refer to them, I viewed myself as a villain. But I like this, for you see, the one thing I've never been able to stand is seeing people who are genuinely happy. People who act like they don't have a problem in the world, even though you know they do, because everybody has problems. Why would I hate happy people? At nearly 60 years old, I can give you an honest answer. It's because I hate myself. I always have, and I'm sure I always will. So, anyway, what I've done for decades now is when I meet someone and I get these empath vibes from them, I'll play the part of wolf in sheep's clothing. I'll be especially nice to these people and butter them up really good and proper to where I can see the smiles on their faces when they see me coming. And then I attack. My attacks are subtle, especially in the beginning. I would always start out with, how have you been, etc. Other cheap small talk yuppies like myself are known, uh, other cheap, cheap small talk yuppies like myself are known for. And once the conversation is going, I'll pull out my pessimism and negative, negativism. I'll remember something the person had said to me in our last conversation, and I'll bring it up and passively, aggressively insult their point of view. One of my favorite attack tactics is a form of gaslighting, where I'll tell someone that they remind me of someone else I know. And when they say, oh yeah, why is that? I'll say, I don't know, you just do. And then I'll go on a tirade about how much that person that they remind me of sucks. I'll talk about how they were dishonest, always cheated on their spouse, how racist they were, and just how terrible they were to be around. And mind you, I'm saying these nasty things about someone that doesn't even exist. Then when my prey says, wow, they sound like a terrible person. In what way do I remind you of them? Because I'm none of those things. I'll just say, yeah, I, I didn't think you were either, but after I got to know them, I, or no, I didn't think they were either, but after I got to know them, I found out the hard way. And then I'll be like, hey, I gotta go. It was great seeing you, and I can't wait to see you again. I know that my tactics work on empaths, and I completely drain them. I've watched some of these night, some of these knaves go into clinical depressions just from me sucking all the positivity out of them and refilling them with all my negativity and pessimism. So, why do I do this, you ask? Because I can. And I enjoy it. I've never been happy and I can't stand seeing people who are. I will hate you more if I know you're happy. And FYI, Mr. Crazy Lake, I have done these very things to you from afar, online, and with multiple fake accounts and profiles. Because I know you are genuinely happy. I completely hate you. Now that you've read that in part, I doubt you'll share my story. Wrong, Margaret. But in the event you choose to prove me wrong and do, please let your fellow empaths know that there are as many of me out there trying to fill people with doom and gloom as there are you empaths out there trying to fill the world with rainbows and sunshine. So, all of you need to choose whom you decide to associate with very wisely. Not your fan, the antipath. The end. So see, my little spiel before the reading was very long-winded, but clearly very appropriate to this story. There are people out there who seek to disrupt your peace. They will abuse you. 
They will treat you badly. They will hurt you physically, emotionally, because they're just, they're antipaths. But we have a say in it. Get away from them. When you see them coming, run as far from them as the east is from the west. Do not allow these people in your life, even if they're blood related. And I would say, especially if they're blood related. Get rid of them. Life is beautiful when you allow it to be. And as long as you have negative, pessimistic antipaths in your circle of influence, you will not enjoy the beauty. It's almost dark and I got a 13 year old kid down there wearing pads and a helmet that I gotta go play football with. Remember, True Hauntings Volume 5, now available in print and Kindle on Amazon. Links in the description box below. Thanks for joining us here at the most awesomest homesteading channel on the planet. It has nothing to do with homesteading. Homesteading off the grid. See you for more next time.